My opening illustration is about childbirth. <clears throat> so if you have a queasy stomach, you may want to leave. But, men, pop quiz, what is going on on May 13th this year? And you can't get it wrong, May 13th. It's a Sunday. It's pretty important. I just mentioned mothers. Mother's Day. Men, you have a month to get ready. In a month, if you forget Mother's Day and your wife comes crying to me, we're going to have some words to talk, okay? So, for those of you um, who have had the pleasure of having a baby, do you remember what childbirth was like? Everybody's like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Someone tried to trick my wife and tell her beforehand, oh, you'll forget it like a couple weeks out. No, it's been four years. No. All right? There's this moment where, where I mean, uh, childbirth, there's a lot of moments leading up to it. And there's, there's a moment where you find out you're pregnant and you get all excited and joyful. And, and then there's the, oh no, what have I just gotten myself into, right? Then I, I remember um, the first time I heard Cora's heartbeat, I bawled like a baby. It's just, it's amazing to see. And then, then they have all this technology stuff now. You can watch the baby grow. And, and I remember the, the first time we got, we got to see Cora with an ultrasound, uh, the, the, the lady who was doing it was like, oh my. And Lindsay's like, what, what, what's going on? Do you have tall people in your family? Because this baby is huge, long, tall. And Lindsay was like, well, yeah, my husband's family's all really big, so great, thanks, you know. But we didn't get any of the, they, they do 3D ultrasounds now, so you can actually see what your baby's going to look like, pretty lifelike, pretty amazing. And, and then as the day gets closer before your baby's born, there's, there's this eager anticipation of the arrival, and you've gotten the home ready, or so you think, and then you realize that first day you, you haven't done anything, right? Um, and, and then uh, the day arrives. It's time for the baby to get here. I remember uh, Cora was a few days late. Um, women are usually late, right? Um, and so we went in on a Monday and, and, and Lindsay's blood pressure was up so they decided to induce her and, and so they induced her Monday night and, and Cora was born at 1.14 in the morning. But, but when you go in to, to have the baby, uh, it's pretty amazing. Labor pains start. And I never really fully appreciated the term labor until I witnessed a baby being born because that's pretty hard work. Pretty hard work. And my guess is, since I've never experienced labor pains, it's your body telling you, get ready, you're about to go through something that's humanly impossible. And you're going to experience tremendous amounts of pain followed by tremendous amounts of joy. So they get you to the hospital and it becomes all about the mother and the baby as it should. They hook up monitors, they restrict food and drink and all sorts of medical equipment comes around and some of the stuff you weren't prepared to see and you had no idea what it was and they didn't cover that in the new parents class. You've got all these questions and, and then the mother proceeds through labor and things get more and more intense. The body changes and does things that, that it shouldn't do. Um, there's a lot of groaning, pushing, yelling screaming, crying in this process, and I'll save you the details of the bodily functions that happen during this process, but, but I have never felt more helpless in my life. Can I get an amen from the dads? Like, all of the doctors and nurses, it's, it's consumed with paying attention to the mom and the baby. And it should be. And, and I felt like, okay, mom's doing great. Okay, I don't want to go down there. Okay. Um, and I just felt like I was in the way all the time. But then the baby shows up. There's relief for the mom as pressure decreases, pain starts to subside, and then you hear the baby scream. And that's probably the only time a baby screaming you enjoy. Because every time after that, you're like, just go to sleep, right? But that first scream of the baby, it's amazing. And, and, and then, like, I don't do well with blood at all. And I told our doctor this. I don't, I'm going to be up holding Lindsay's hand. I don't want anything to do with what's going on down there. Just leave me alone. Then he said, Scott, do you want to cut the cord? 
no, Doc, I told you I want nothing to do with that. Clip it, let's go. Like, anyway. I should have, but I didn't. I was ready to pass out, actually, so it's pretty good. So then the baby gets carted over, taken over, and the nurses kind of get some oxygen going, take some measurements, and then, then they bring the baby right back to the mom. So, so the bonding process can begin, and, and I was completely lost. I got yelled at numerous times, just get out of the way. Adrenaline was... I don't do well after 9 o'clock at night either, so this was like at 1.15 in the morning. But that adrenaline just keeps you going, and then... Once the adrenaline wears off, it hits you. I'm a dad. I've got a daughter. I have no idea what I'm doing. I clearly do not have enough guns at home. Not enough security cameras up. God, I need wisdom and patience. I need your help. What I just described to you is like a hours long thing and if you haven't experienced childbirth it's amazing and wonderful and gross but it's awesome but it's awesome in the passage we're going to look at today in Romans chapter 8 Paul's describing what's going on in the world as the pains of childbirth the pains of childbirth and we're going to see how one's couple decision at the beginning of time has caused the world and caused people to groan and groan and groan because things are not as they should be. But there's coming a time where the pain will stop, peace will return, and life will be perfect. So the beginning part of this when we talk about groaning and what happened in the world, I don't want you to lose hope because there's an end to the story. And it's that hope that we need to hold on to. So Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory He will, will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who His children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present. Time. There's something going on in the world that's causing the world that we live in to groan. And it's experiencing this, it says, against its will because of the curse God placed upon mankind. Well, what curse is that? It's the curse from Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. If you remember Genesis 1 and 2, the world is perfect. God set it up and designed it. The world is perfect. Man is, is in perfect relationship with his wife. There's no discord. There's no forgetting Mother's Day. There's no forgetting birthdays. Right? There's no anger and animosity between Adam and his wife Eve. Things are going great. Adam and Eve have daily walks through a garden with God. Talking with God face to face. Perfect relationship. When Adam's hungry, he reaches up and just grabs a piece of fruit from a tree. Perfect relationship. He doesn't get attacked by bears. Right? Perfect relationship. But then Adam and Eve disobey God in Genesis 3 and things are never the same. And that's what it's talking about in Romans 8 where it says that, that uh, all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who His children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. And this is the curse that creation was subjected to. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, it says this, And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife, Man, you're supposed to listen to your wife, okay? It's what she had him do. Anyway, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. One of my least favorite activities is pulling weeds. That's why I'm okay with winter. 
You don't have to do that. And every time I go to pull weeds, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Eve. Because their disobedience cursed the ground. So things are not as God created them from here on out. The rest of the story. We are called to be stewards of God's creation. And that's, people don't like the word environmentalism, but followers of Christ should be the biggest environmentalists that we have. We should take care of this world much better than we are. But it wasn't only man and the environment that was influenced. It was every relationship imaginable. Man and God, that relationship was severed. They used to walk in the garden, presence together, had perfect harmony, and then it was severed. That wasn't the case anymore. And then relationships between man and man were, were corrupted. You have murder going on in Genesis with Cain and his, his brother Abel. Sin starts to permeate every single relationship. The world is not as it should be. Does anybody think the world is as it should be? We just spent $224 million bombing a country halfway across the world. There's wars, there's famine, there's children starving. And not just in Africa anymore, but here in the United States. The world is not as it should be. But... The pain that creation is in right now, the pain that the world is experiencing, it will end someday. There will be a new heaven. There will be a new earth. Earth will be liberated when Christ returns. Listen to Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. There's four chapters in the entire Bible that do not have any sin in them. Genesis 1 and 2, and the last two chapters of Revelation. That's it. Between those, it's all about sin, disrupted relationships, and ultimately about the plan of God to restore every single relationship. Verse 18 in Romans 8 talks about the hope of glory. With this hope of, of this future glory that God's going to reveal to us, with this hope in our hearts, we're free to sacrifice our time, sacrifice our finances, to take risks, to lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel. Because that future hope of glory is there. And it's ours. So all of creation is groaning. The second aspect of this passage is that believers are groaning. Listen to verses 23 to 25. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as His adopted children, including the new bodies He has promised us. Amen. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't, ha we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. Because you've identified as a believer, Paul is talking past tense here about already being saved. We've experienced the Holy Spirit. And because we believe in Christ, because we've accepted Christ's forgiveness, we have that Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. And he talks in here about adoption. That's when we can experience the blessings of God now. We've been adopted. Right? We have that joy. Listen, uh, go back up to Romans 8, verse 17. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with, with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. And we oftentimes stop there. Oh, everything's supposed to be peachy. My life is supposed to be perfect when I accept Christ, right? Right? Everything's supposed to fall into place. I'm supposed to be healthy despite the fact I overeat. I'm supposed to have wealth despite the fact that I overspend. I'm supposed to be prosperous even though that's not the attitude that I have. That's the way life is supposed to be. But that's not the rest of the verse. The last half of verse 17, but if we are to share in His glory, we must also share in His suffering. Anybody suffering today? Are sad, lonely, depressed, hungry, angry, bitter, tired, suffering? We're not promised perfection yet. We're going to get to it here pretty soon. 
where we've been promised not only the glory of God, but the suffering. We've seen what sin has done to our life. The Holy Spirit has revealed that, but He's also given us a glimpse of what life without sin will be like. That's the foretaste of future glory He's talking about. This is what we often call already, not yet, where we're adopted sons and daughters, but we won't receive all that comes with that until we get to heaven or until Christ returns. That's why we still experience pain and suffering and temptation. Because the world isn't set right yet. And we groan because of we groan in anticipation or excitement over getting close to our final de- destination. I remember growing up, we always took car rides. And, and if you've never been in a car driving through the state of Nebraska, you haven't experienced life. <laughs> But we would start in the middle of Nebraska and we every summer we would get in our car, an 85 uh, Chevy Citation. Anybody know what those little itty bitty cars are? And there were five of us and my dad always brought his fishing poles. Anyway, um, so we would get in that, we'd drive across Nebraska, across Wyoming, dear Lord help us. And then we'd cross Utah and, and we went up into Oregon and, and, and Washington and Idaho and all that. But we barely got out of town. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we th- See, now we have phones and stuff to distract us. You know what we had back then? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Slinkies, which was good for about five minutes. Then I was lucky. I was the youngest of three children, so I got to sit in the middle with the fishing poles over me, and I got to bug my brother. Anyway, are we there yet? Are we th- that should be our attitude towards heaven. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Because you were so excited to get to your final destination, weren't you? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? But the Bible tells us in verse 25 that we are to wait patiently. Wait patiently. We're waiting for new bodies, this new heaven, this new earth, this rest, this rewards, this this eternal family that we're going to be welcomed into, the, the absence of sin, the absence of suffering and tears, of death and joy, I'm sorry, of death and pain. We're waiting for joy. We're waiting for Jesus. Revelation chapter 21 verses 2 and 4 say, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among His people. He will live with them and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them. Wow. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's what we wait patiently for. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. We groan waiting patiently for Christ's return. The world is groaning. Believers are groaning. There's one more groaning to get to the third groaning. Groaning, groaning, groaning. The Holy Spirit groans. Listen to verse 26 and 27. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us Believers in harmony with God's own will. I don't want to get into a theological argument about the tongues in the church today, but it's clear from this passage, this is the Holy Spirit that's groaning. It's the Holy Spirit that's pleading and interceding on our behalf. Other translations use the words like wordless or too deep for words. What's going on here is unspoken or inexpressible. The Holy Spirit is groaning because of our sin. You see, the Holy Spirit's God. God despises sin. He can't even look at it. And it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our sin and convinces us of our need for a Savior. And in this passage, the Holy Spirit is pleading or interceding on our behalf. He's making a petition to God. How many of you have ever been praying and you just lose your words? You don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit is interceding at that moment for you. 
He knows what's on your heart. He knows what's on your mind. And He will take those requests and petitions, even the ones you don't know, and take them to God. And we need to trust that the Holy Spirit knows our needs, knows what we're thinking. And prayer for other people is one of the main activities of a follower of Christ. And we have to steward that well. One of the ways we do that is we have prayer lists. Lists of people and things that we're praying for. If you don't have one of those, it's very simple. You get out a sheet of paper and you start writing down people you know. you got a prayer list. Start praying. I hope my name would be on that, selfishly. Right? But start praying for people. So I want to conclude today by looking at the last three verses and just making a few observations, if you would. The first observation is that God's perspective and plan is about His glory and not our happiness. If your view of God is that He is Santa Claus here to give you gifts and make you happy, you're wrong. You are here to give God glory, to reflect His glory, to bring glory to Him, to make Him famous. Verse 28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love and are called according to His purposes for them. It's one of the most misunderstood and misapplied verses in the Bible. When you lose a job, this doesn't mean that God has a better job for you. When you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, this doesn't mean God's going to provide you with a better one. Whenever something bad happens, whatever it is, You can fill in the blank. It doesn't mean you're going to experience blessing this side of heaven because of it. The word that's translated good in that verse, and we know God causes everything to work together for the good, that good needs to be viewed from God's perspective, not yours. That's why a lot of us are dissatisfied. Well, God, this is supposed to be good, and you're looking at it through your lens, not God's lens. For an example, perhaps you lost your job, because you were becoming materialistic and needed to be humbled. Perhaps you broke up with your boyfriend or girlfriend because God's going to call you and send you somewhere where you can't be married. Where you can't have a relationship. The mission field. Perhaps, fill in the blank, happened because God sees the end end results. So God's perspective and plan is about His glory, not our happiness. The second observation, God has a plan and we're part of it. Verses 29 and 30, For God knew His people in advance. He chose them to become like His Son, so that His Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, He called them to come to Him. And having called them, He gave them right standing with Himself. Having given them right standing, He gave them His glory. This passage is talking about predestination, free will, election. And you know what? Some riddles will never be adequately explained. Whenever I get asked the question, do you believe in in predestination or free will? Do you know what I say? Yes. Well, which one is it? Yes. What do you mean? Yeah, I have no idea. But yes. Yes. The Bible teaches both. There's been much smarter people debate these verses over the years, but what they teach is that God's plan involves us eagerly anticipating and waiting for Christ's return so that we can stop groaning. So if you can see that there's something wrong with creation, if you can see that things are not right, in your fellow man, let me ask you, do you trust Christ? Do you trust that He's provided a way out of these groaning pains, this pain of childbirth that we're all in? Do you trust that Christ died on the cross for you and your sins? Do you trust that if you believe in Him, you will be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But what about all these other things I'm supposed to do to get right with God? Well, we'll work on that later. Belief. 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 
if that's the case, you will experience some pain and suffering in this world. But when your physical body dies, all of that pain and suffering will stop. There will be no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrows. And if that's something you're not sure of, all you need to do is ask God to save you. He's already done it. You just need to say thank you. And believe that what Christ did on the cross was sufficient because you see the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people, sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who's God in the flesh, to bear God's wrath against sin on the cross and then to show His power over sin in the resurrection so that all who have faith in Him will be reconciled to God forever. And you know what? That reconciliation with God should be your first concern. But when your relationship with God gets right, you know what starts to happen? Your relationship with other people starts to get better. I can always tell when my relationship with God is out of whack because Lindsay and I start to have disagreements. What's going on here? Oh yeah, I haven't read my Bible in a couple days. Oh, I haven't been, been praying. That my relationship with God is out of whack and it's influencing other people. I look back at my life and any time I had a disagreement with my dad, I was rebelling against my dad, but it started with rebelling against God. God, you've called me to do this. I don't want to. God, you've asked me to do this. You know what? I don't want to. Be reconciled to God. Experience reconciliation with man. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that your plan is perfect. We're grateful that you've asked us to be a part of it, but honestly, Lord, sometimes we're scared of what that means. Lord, when we look at the world around us, when we look at our friends and we look at our family, we often wonder what in the world is going on. Why is there all this pain and suffering? Why is, is there heartache? Why are there disagreements? Why is the world not as it should be? Why can't we just get along? But Lord, your word teaches us that that's the way it is because we've been disobedient to you. Because we're sinners in need of a Savior. Lord, we are grateful that you did not leave us there. That the disruption that we experience, the suffering that we experience, does not have to be permanent. The differences that we have with you, God, have already been paid for. That, that They've already been mended. We just have to step into that relationship. We just have to believe Jesus Christ. And yeah, we'll still groan on earth but we groan in eager anticipation of what's to come, what your word has promised us. So Lord, it's that hope of glory that we celebrate today. Amen.